Let me begin with a very simple statement. We at Charlotte do not claim yet to have become a fully developed university. On the other hand, let me now make very clear that we intend to build here not only a fully developed university, but as soon as possible, a great university. And that in so doing, we believe we reflect the spirit of the motto of the people of this great state in 1893, to be rather than to seem. Those words are not mine. They were spoken by Dean Calvert 39 years ago at his installation as the first chancellor. But they reflect a central tenet of our institutional culture to this day. We have never wanted to appear to be something that we are not. But we do have high aspirations, and we expect to become a great university, one that not only brings pride to the people of this region, but to all of the people of North Carolina. Our path has been steady and sure, blessed by the visionary leadership provided by our founder, Ms. Bonnie Cohn, and built upon by three extraordinary chancellors, Dean Colbert, E.K. Fretwell, and Jim Woodward. E.K. himself, in his installation address, said this, I feel that I'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Well, that's two more high than E.K. had. I'm looking from the shoulders of giants. My debt of gratitude to my predecessors is profound, but it is especially powerful when I speak of Jim Woodward. As I said in November when we dedicated Woodward Hall, I owe a good part of my professional life and what I think about higher education to Jim, a good part of my suspicion of architects and my antipathy toward external accreditors I owe to Jim. <laughs> my understanding of why pizza is a better lunch choice than chicken I owe to Jim. <laughs> and walk around this campus and you'll know that my appreciation for red brick as the gold standard of construction I owe to Jim. Of course, professional development cannot happen without the support from family and friends. My brother Paul is here, and my late parents made sure that I took full advantage of what a public higher education has to offer, and my brother made damn sure I could pass calculus. And I've been truly blessed with the extraordinary marriage to Lisa Lewis Dubois and the smiles and pride that daily we share in Logan, Taylor, and Alley. As Al Simpson has often observed, I seriously overmarried. <laughs> I would like to cover several topics this morning, but I know that installation addresses always cause a certain amount of controversy or conversation. I don't want to cause so much controversy that President Bowles finds it necessary to remove, remove me from, from my responsibilities. But I do have a reputation for speaking my mind. And in all cases, in the words of the late Clark Kerr, the former president of the University of California, I want to leave this job as I enter it, fired with enthusiasm. <laughs> so I'll begin with our academic mission. A significant strength of this campus is a well-established academic planning process and an ambitious academic plan. The fundamentals of the original 1994 academic plan continue to serve us well, and under the leadership of Joan Lorden and our deans, the planning process is much improved. The most important conclusion to be drawn from our current academic plan is that the vision we have been pursuing is the right vision. We should be one of North Carolina's most significant public research universities, drawing focus and strength from the region we serve. And in working within, within this region, our watchwords should be energetic, responsive, and collaborative. We should be partners, not preachers. My time today does not permit a detailed review of that plan, but I can say that we have a fascinating set of opportunities in front of us. Indeed, one can simply tour the prominent new buildings on this campus to understand the enhanced academic capacity of UNC Charlotte to serve this region's higher education needs. In the Woodward Hall, we've established our regional and national presence in biological sciences and information technology. The new engineering research building houses our long-established premier program in precision engineering 
and the increasingly important Motorsports Engineering Program. Proposed initiatives in construction management and systems engineering, each with importance for this region, hold promise. Our new optoelectronics building will allow full development of that initiative, and the new bioinformatics research center will bring us increased recognition in a broad range of applications at the intersection of several disciplines. All of these efforts will be facilitated and linked to our community by the Charlotte Research Institute, our portal to the outside world of potential research collaborators and industrial consumers of our work. In our new College of Education building, we will continue our leadership in the preparation of teachers, particularly in high-need areas, and in the preparation of visionary educational administrators. No institution in North Carolina, public or private, prepares more second career teachers than UNC Charlotte, and we will maintain this distinction. And we will cooperate with our colleagues in the Charlotte Mecklenburg schools to explore alternative models for the high school years, while continuing our strong partnership with the 13 school districts of the Southwest Education Alliance. Next door to education, we will soon move into a new building for the College of Health and Human Services, and the opportunities there are exciting as well. The state probably cannot afford another medical school, but we can work with the local health care community to, to identify the needs most critical in the region for health care professionals. And the growing research capacity of UNC Charlotte can be married more closely with the hospitals and clinicians in this region to make Charlotte a center for translational research in biomedicine and bioengineering. At our front door on Highway 49, sits the handsome new Robinson Hall for the performing arts, and nearby a renovated row arts building. Those buildings only hint at our potential for regional arts leadership, potential we should explore with the arts leaders of Charlotte and the region. And we should look inside our own university to see whether there are creative synergies that might be realized by the creation of a new academic college that would house architecture and the arts. The center of eight, any great university is the College of Arts and Sciences, producing nearly half of our graduates and disproportionately responsible for our general education curriculum. Arts and Sciences faculty are also critical to a number of our new doctoral programs, including a cutting-edge proposal for a doctorate in nanoscale science. As we think long-term about our doctoral programs, we must include the social sciences and the humanities. And at the same time, we know that the academic marketplace for graduates in many of these disciplines is oversupplied, and we must be able to demonstrate a clear need. Looking to the center city of Charlotte, we envision a major presence there, a place that will allow us to focus our graduate programs in the Belk College of Business. Center City Charlotte is all about financial services, and thus UNC Charlotte should be home to one of the nation's strongest programs, in finance. And the emergence of a full range of important sports franchises in this city opens the door for a first-rate program in sports management and marketing. I'm hopeful that such a program, if properly implemented by Dean Claude Lilly and his colleagues, should ensure that the Chancellor and his wife enjoy premium seating at some of the great sporting events of our city. No pressure, Claude. That's a of course, a center city facility would not just be important to the financial community. It will also house the offerings of several other colleges that address the needs of professionals in that area. Healthcare, law enforcement, social service, and government. These workers live and work near the downtown area. So our, our academic plans are ambitious. But are they ambitious enough to meet the needs of our region? This past fall, we enrolled 20,772 students. The current enrollment target for UNC Charlotte, as set by the Board of Governors, is for 28,000 students to be enrolled by the year 2012. Will 28,000 be sufficient? That question demands our attention. This entire metropolitan statistical area is currently served by two public universities, UNC Charlotte and Winthrop University in South Carolina, with total enrollments of just about 26,000 students. But look at the 23 other 
metropolitan statistical areas across the country that currently house populations of the size that Charlotte is today or will be by the year 2020, perhaps two million people or more, and you will find public universities that serve an average of 40,000 students. It's too early to say what size we might need to be to properly serve this region, but at 28,000, we might win only the distinction of being the country's metropolitan region most poorly served by higher education. Accordingly, later this spring, I will ask the provost to lead a task force that will look at that issue. At this point, it is not reasonable to think that we could end up being the state's largest public university. Our enrollment planning must include the development of a balanced philosophy with respect to offering off-campus and online education for those who live and work at greater distances, and in so doing, we must anticipate the long-term implications of the completion of the Interstate 485 ring and the development of light rail up the Northeast Corridor on Tryon Street. We need to think hard about the optimal mix that we seek in our undergraduate and graduate enrollments and the extent of the commitment we want to make in doctoral education. We do not want to become overextended, and we must properly support the graduate students that we admit to doctoral study. As we build our inventory of programs, we should consider new models for the management of faculty positions. Although we must respond to enrollment demands in our existing programs, we may require a mechanism for the cluster hiring of faculty to quickly expand institutional capacity for new programs or for interdisciplinary initiatives. These remarks should suggest to you that we're going to continue on the track of building a major research university. We have defined that goal principally in terms of the classification system of the Carnegie Commission for the Advancement of Teaching. But that system is under revision, and under President Bowles, we can expect a review of institutional missions by the Board of Governors. That review is both timely and appropriate. However, as I've said at the University Convocation just this past fall, our ambition is not the result of some abstract academic arms race. It is instead a recognition that public research universities have been central to the development of most of the large metropolitan regions of this country, even in states that have traditional flagship and land-grant institutions as well. Our view of higher education in North Carolina must not be frozen in time. One thing I can say is that we, as we contemplate our possible growth, we must remember the old adage, big is not necessarily better. Quality does matter. UNC Charlotte's reputation as an outstanding undergraduate institution came about because of the commitment of the administration and the faculty to provide teaching arrangements that guaranteed the deep involvement of our faculty in the undergraduate experience. For that reason, we need to develop a set of dashboard indicators that will annually help us monitor the consequences of our growth and the health of our undergraduate mission. Before I leave this broad topic of our academic future, let me address the important topic of how central the achievement of cultural diversity is to that future. Walking around this campus for the past seven months, it is evident to me that UNC Charlotte is a much more diverse place than when I left in 1997. The goal of creating an inclusive campus community is already embodied in the university's institutional plan, reflecting this long-held belief of this campus that diversity isn't just the right thing to do, it's an educational and business necessity. In response to this imperative, UNC Charlotte has not been standing still. All of our institutional plans include initiatives that recognize the importance of diversity and internationalization as in integral parts of our curriculum, the student experience, and the daily life of the campus. But notwithstanding our evident commitment, there is frustration with the pace of progress the apparent lack of coordination among some of our programs, and the absence of effective mechanisms for tracking and evaluating our progress. So as a first step, we will reconstitute the Council on University Community, composed of all of our vice chancellors, reporting directly to me to ensure that the senior level of the administration has its eyes focused on the target.
first task of the Council will be to assemble, for the first time, a comprehensive university diversity plan that forces us to assess, with brutal reality as our guide, what is working and what isn't. I do not intend for the Council to function as an overload responsibility of our senior administrators, so we will staff that body with a full-time administrative assistant to keep our work moving forward to bring coherence, visibility, and accountability to our efforts. And we, we will create a $100,000 Chancellor's Fund to create challenge grants to seed the development of the many good ideas that exist on this campus to promote the daily value of, a, of diversity in the intellectual life of UNC Charlotte. At the same time that we build our programs in enrollment, we must expand our presence in the greater Charlotte region and distinguish ourselves in the higher education marketplace with an identity that is both recognizable and respected. Such an identity expressed as part of a strategic marketing plan which addresses all forms of the media and the World Wide Web is critical to student recruitment, the development of student internship opportunities, job placement opportunities, private fundraising, and the formation of university private sector research partnerships. Establishing an institutional approach to our brand marketing will not be without pain, and it will offend traditional notions of academic autonomy. Moreover, successful organizations have found that an effective identity is not simply a slogan or a tagline. Our constituents, whether our parents, students, alumni, research partners, or the public at large, must actually experience what we say we are. It is for that reason that I do not subscribe to the view that raising UNC Charlotte's presence either regionally, in the state, or nationally is simply a matter of changing our name. It is the academic reputation, the brand equity, of the University of North Carolina system that helps us to attract the best faculty, staff, and students. In short, we won't be looking for a quick fix to the challenge of institutional identity. Whatever we may do in branding and marketing cannot end with the public relations staff or the web page. UNC Charlotte must actually become better connected to the region that we serve. I've already taken important steps to organize our efforts for this approach with the creation of the new Division of University Relations and Community Affairs headed by Vice Chancellor David Dunn. I've also asked David to chair a new University Relations Economic Development Council to facilitate regional awareness of our principal enterprises relating to economic development, including the Charlotte Research Institute. But economic development cannot be our only linchpin to this community. And as I suggested earlier, we may have a larger role to play in the cultural landscape, landscape of Charlotte through our programs in the fine and performing arts. And we have other important connections through entities such as the Charlotte Community Design Studio, the Institute for Social Capital, and the Urban Institute. The Charlotte region offers us one of the premier urban laboratories in this country. We're large enough to have almost one of every kind of present or emerging urban issue, and we're small enough to address those issues in productive ways. Our role is captured by the words of the President of the American Association of State Colleges and Universities. Public universities are stewards of place. Wherever the Charlotte region struggles with where it wants to go, it should look to the University of North Carolina at Charlotte to help figure it out. And on those occasions where it seems appropriate for us to do so, we will lead. The prospects for continued growth demand that we think creatively also about the physical evolution of the main campus in the next revision of our campus, academic, excuse me, campus master plan. Ambitious academic and facility plans like this, of course, require additional resources. Yet it has been the case from the beginning of UNC Charlotte, we know that we're going to be forced to stretch every person and every dollar as we build our future. Unfortunately, the funding formulas that are used in our system only address incre incremental change in our enrollment. And when combined with the General Assembly's tendency on occasion to reduce the university's budget in amounts that significantly offset enrollment increase dollars, there are days when it seems like that Sisyphus might be a more fitting mascot than Norm the Niner. 
Certainly, we are grateful, though, this year that some of the funding needs of UNC Charlotte were recognized this past July with a special state appropriation of $5 million, with an additional $5 million to come this next July. And I know that all of us can heartily endorse President Bowles' intention to see whether harmful budget reductions can be avoided by placing the university's enrollment growth funding in the state's continuation budget. I also know that President Bowles is keenly aware that the greatest budgetary challenge facing our institutions is to increase the competitiveness of our salary and benefits. So I want to wish the President all the best as he takes on these formidable challenges. And I want him to know that he has my support and that while I'm an advocate for UNC Charlotte, I am first and foremost an advocate for the University of North Carolina system. That system was formed for a reason, to serve the people of the state and not the interests of the campuses. I also want the President to know that if he is successful, we will welcome him when he drives the armored car full of new money to UNC Charlotte. But Mr. President, when you arrive with your armored car, we want to make sure that you can find a place to park it. <laughs> so if you will join me at the podium here for a moment, I would like to present you with something that our faculty, staff, and students could easily agree is the most precious, the most valuable thing that one must possess to be successful at UNC Charlotte, a reserved parking plate. <laughs> worth its weight in gold. <laughs> Until the armored car arrives, we must do what we can with what we have and make sure we're as efficient and as effective as possible in the use of our resources. That, so therefore, be before we decide how we're going to spend the second installment of $5 million, we will initiate a budget re-examination to determine where our dollars are invested and why, to explore what options we have for how those dollars are deployed and how the functions they support are performed. We will benchmark our academic and administrative staffing levels against comparable institutions, and we will look for cost savings, strategic reallocations, and cost avoidance strategies where possible. We have many budgetary needs throughout this institution, but two stand out to me as a result just of my first few months here. Departmental support and information technology our budget re-examination must give particular attention to those areas, both of which affect the ability of the faculty and the staff to work productively day in and day out. We can also realize some important budget, re budget efficiencies by undertaking the difficult job of determining the optimal, optimal balance between centralized and decentralized information technology services. Our budget re-examination must eventually also include an examination of how we use our instructional resources. A huge challenge with both academic and financial implications comes from looking at our graduation statistics. Today, well under 50% of our students complete their degree programs within six years. Each student who drops out of UNC Charlotte and does not finish his or her degree, represent, that represents a loss to the stockpile of intellectual and social capital needed by our region and our state. But if you're a member of the faculty and staff and you don't find that persuasive, let me put a cold, self-interested economic spin on it. A mere 5% improvement in the retention rate of one class of freshmen and transfer students could produce approximately $2.6 million in our budget in the first four years in tuition and fee income alone. Student success is related in substantial measure to students' academic preparation, so our continuing work with the schools and the community colleges takes on another level of importance. And we know that we could help UNC Charlotte students graduate in greater numbers if we could substitute additional need-based financial aid for the income they currently earn in jobs that they require to stay in school. Beyond addressing these issues, we need to continue our excellent collaborative work between academic and student affairs to promote the academic and social connection of students to this university. At the same time that we question how we spend our money, 
we also need to focus very sharply on how we do our business. We start from a very strong position. Under Jim Woodward and our superb Vice Chancellor for Business Affairs, Olin Smith, we own a reputation that is earned as one of the very best managed campuses in the UNC system. Going forward, we need, though, to be careful that our growth as a research university does not outpace the capacity of our administrative procedures and our business operations. We also need to move aggressively to minimize redundant operations and to replace paperwork with digital record keeping and electronic transactions. Perhaps more than anything, we need a cultural shift that moves toward embracing some level of risk taking as a part of the calculus of how we do our business. To quote a National Commission on Public Universities, it is unfortunately the case that many of the policies and procedures designed to keep bad things from happening are increasingly keeping good things from happening. Let me shift gears briefly to talk about another important set of challenges as we deepen our research base and our resource base. We are first and foremost the public's university, but we also depend upon the private generosity of friends and alumni. And as anyone who knows me will tell you, I see friend, friend, friend raising and fundraising as going, going hand in hand. After all, what are friends for? <laughs> UNC Charlotte has been especially fortunate to have benefited from the generosity of individual and corporate members of this community who are not alumni, but who have understood the importance of Charlotte having an outstanding public research university. Well, they've done their part. They've pushed us off the starting line. To run the long race, we must activate our closest friends, our alumni, the ones who were helped along by the encouraging words of a faculty member or were able to achieve their dream of getting a college degree because of the helping hand extended to them by a privately funded scholarship. We can best build this approach from the bottom up by strengthening support for fundraising by our colleges and our academic departments, and by making better and more effective use of our college advisory committees. At a campus-wide level, we've already taken steps to restructure the board of the University of North Carolina Charlotte Foundation so that we can enlist more effectively the next generation of foundation leaders. And as we mature as an institution, our alumni association becomes even more important. We must reach out to the graduates in this region, in other parts of the state, and in major cities outside of North Carolina, where our alumni now live and work. Certainly one important additional way to strengthen UNC Charlotte's ties to its alumni and friends is through our intercollegiate athletics program. Athletics is certainly not more importantly more important than academics, but it can be a big part of raising our visibility. As my basketball coach in Wyoming used to say, basketball is not more important than physics or philosophy, but it is more likely to be covered on ESPN. <laughs> it's no secret I'm a big fan of college athletics, so I've had no trouble moving from the brown and the gold to the green and the white. But my Niner pride does not come solely from counting our wins and our losses. Under the leadership of Judy Rose and with the support of our 49er Athletic Foundation, our athletic programs are a model for higher education. We play by the rules. We stay in the black financially. Nearly 90% of the student athletes who have exhausted their eligibility earn their college degrees. Even with this record of success, we can improve. A top priority is to get all of our men's and women's programs fully funded. And we have a lot of work to do to raise the visibility of UNC Charlotte Athletics in this community. My dream is for the following conversation to be heard around the water coolers of Charlotte. Say, did you hear that Carolina beat Duke and State beat Wake last night? And the response, gee, I must have missed that. I was at the 49er game. <laughs> by the way, we play tomorrow at 2, right here. Let me close again by quoting Dean Colbert. We do not wish to seem to be that which we are not, but we do seek the opportunity to progress reasonably toward that which we are expected to become, a university of which this state can be proud and to which it can turn 
with appropriate expectations. Like many higher education institutions in the modern era, we often find ourselves caught between seemingly incompatible viewpoints. Concerned as they should be about the quality of our academics, faculty members sometimes think that university administrators only care about the business side of the institution, worry too much about the bottom line than the education of the students. In contrast, some outside observers think university leaders don't really understand business principles, and we fail to give sufficient attention to way, in ways that we can make the university more cost-effective and efficient. Neither is true. The university is a large economic entity, and we must be good stewards of the public dollars that are invested in it. But we also need to pay close attention to the quality of the educational experience that we provide each and every student. These perspectives are not incompatible. And at the end of the day, there should be no confusion about what we do in higher education. Our business is opportunity. Our currency is human capital. We deal in the most fundamental and renewable resource of this or any century, knowledge. And our balance of payments is always in the black, helping to convert those with potential and promise into productive citizens who form the background of our economy and our democracy. I thank all of you who share the passion for the enterprise of higher education and the vision that this institution, UNC Charlotte, can be among the nation's best in that business. Thank you very much. Thank you.